Welcome to Africa Speaks. I'm Pamela Anchang. He has been named among America's top plastic surgeons by the Consumers Research Council of America. Born in Africa, Dr. Michael K. Obeng's inspiring story is one of perseverance and massive success against all odds. Aptly described as the gifted doctor, Dr. Obeng is among the rare and few surgeons in the world to successfully reattach a limb. He is an expert in complex reconstructive surgery, hand and micro neurovascular surgery. Plastic surgeon to the stars in Beverly Hills, California, Dr. Obeng is equally a humanitarian. Through his charity, Restore, he provides free reconstructive surgery to patients in third world countries. His surgical successes, aesthetic and reconstructive expertise and charitable work are often featured on television news such as ABC, CBS, NBC, Fox, and in many local, national, and international publications. These accomplishments have earned him many prestigious awards. He has also published extensively and lectures on plastic and reconstructive surgery to international audiences and when he is not speaking on plastic surgery, he can be found around the nation giving his award-winning motivational speech, Perseverance. We all could use a dose of inspiration, and so we welcome to Africa Speaks, Dr. Michael K. Obeng, the gifted doctor. Thank you for joining us on Africa Speaks, Dr. Obeng. So here we are, Dr. Michael K. Obeng. That's a beautiful name. Thank you. <laughs> We're sitting here in your surgical unit. Did you dream about this? Did you ever envisage this as you grew up in your childhood? Yes and no. You know, uh, as a, at an early age, at a, around 12, 13, I knew I wanted to be a doctor. You know? But it wasn't until about 15, 16 that mm -hmm. I knew I wanted to be a surgeon. But now in my wildest dream, you know, I thought I would own my own surgery center and probably my own practice. You know? So this is a dream come true. Dream come true. And um, it's an amazing. So let's start from the beginning. Tell us a little bit about where you're from and um, how you got to be. No, you know what? Just tell us a little bit where you're from I'm first. From, <laughs> I'm from heaven. Yes. <laughs> I'm from heaven, by the way, of Ghana. Yeah. You know, but I was born and raised in Ghana. I was mm -hmm. born and raised in Ghana to a very loving family. Mm. Um, and uh, with the blessings of God, hard work and perseverance. Um, I managed to escape Ghana. When I say escape Ghana, of course, growing up in Ghana at the time, Ghana was not as uh, uh, a middle class country as it is today. Maybe it was, but my family and I, we did not feel that. And uh, I grew up, you know, in Ghanaian standards, I grew up poor. Wow. But of course, much better than a lot of Ghanaian kids. Uh, you know, at least I have shoes. Mm -hmm. And I know some kids that not have shoes. But, yeah. uh, one, thing that, one thing that I remember that I had shorts that and you're from Africa, so you know, when you sit down for so long, you have the holes in the back of the shorts. Yes. I had those one of those shorts. And, you know, to, to be at this point in my life with all this blessing and all this grace, uh, it's just uh, you know, a true blessing from God. So mm -hmm. uh, coming from Ghana to here was not a small task. Uh, you know, I've always dreamed of coming to America to study because uh, growing up in Ghana, we knew to make it to the top, you have to know people. You have to have a, be growing up, you know, grow up in a political family, mm -hmm. you know, wealthy. The opportunities were not that bound, that great for everybody, except for a select few. Mm -hmm. And just to put things in perspective, even growing up in Ghana, when I left Ghana, there were only three universities in Ghana. Wow. If I had lived in Ghana, I'd probably never go to medical school because of the fact that you had to know somebody. All you have to be, you know, score extremely high because there are not that many, you know, seats in a medical school class. You know, but now Ghana has over 30 universities, so everything has changed. And, um, you know, I would not change anything. I would not change the path that God had designed for me or designed for me that I have been on. It's been an amazing path with trials and tribulation. But, uh, you know, you have to keep <laughs> on moving. You can't yeah. let anything stop you in your tracks. Yeah. Yeah. You know, 
you do a lot of speeches and um, perseverance is one of those things that you talk about a lot. And just hearing you talk about your childhood, many of us that grew up in Africa, we know how challenging it is. But when somebody says, I grew up poor, well, we already know Africa has challenges and poverty. But when you say, I grew up poor, that means you understood what it meant not to have. So what does this word perseverance mean to you? Now, perseverance is a word I picked up when I was in fifth grade. Uh, I probably was the first time I heard the word perseverance. But, uh, you know, it goes back to that time when one of my math, he, you know, he was a teacher, but uh, actually he's a guy who inspired me. He made me love mathematics more because <laughs> of the fact that he was such a great teacher. Mm -hmm. but, you know, one day in class you talk about perseverance, how through the power of perseverance he was able to change his course, to come from the village and now he's teaching the city. And that was... A success for him, and that's the wow. first time I heard the word perseverance. Mm -hmm. And I took that word to heart, that word never left me. And I said, If Master Mantel wow. can do this, I can persevere, I can do anything I want to do. But that was the first time I heard that word, it was in fifth grade. But you know, with perseverance, you know, what it means to me is not giving up, you know, not giving up because, uh, you know, where I grew up, where I grew up, and where I came from, okay. I had nothing to lose but just to keep working hard and dreaming and aiming for the stars. You know, and that's what perseverance means to me. But you know, doing the work and not, you know, not quitting until the work is done. Absolutely. And there's still a lot of work to be done. You know, sometimes yeah, we get we get a little uh, complacent because you know we taste we taste a little success, but uh, <laughs> you know, it's not over until the day that we can pass on the baton to the next generation and so on and so forth. So you tell young people today, persevere. Persevere. Don't give up. <laughs> it's know, the only way out. No, no circumstance is permanent. Mm -hmm. you know, exactly. No circumstance. And we, as individuals, have mm -hmm. the, our own power mm -hmm. to change a circumstance. Of course, with the power of the will of God. You know, I don't know if people's belief system, but I mm -hmm. believe in God. Without God, I would not be sitting mm -hmm. here talking to you. And uh, you know, God has created us to all succeed. But the question is, are we willing to do what it takes to succeed? Yeah. So your journey now from all of that, and it's so funny how you describe not coming from a political family, connections, because Africa is all about connections. Even the United States though, but Africa is the worst. Either you're going to score so high to get a scholarship, or you know somebody, or you have a, some rich parent, yeah. and you say you didn't have any of those. So how did you come to the United States? <laughs> what motivated you to believe that you could get out of there and come to the United States? So one thing I always knew I had was I had the gifts. I had a good brain. You know, um, <laughs> Thank God. At, at an early age, I knew I was intelligent. Um, I was always number one in my class at an early age. And I knew that the only way I can change my course in life was through education. I also knew that the only way I can become what I wanted to be was going to America. Why America? Because I had uncles who lived here. And they sent money back home my grandmother. My grandmother raised me. My mom worked a lot. Growing up, my father was not in my life. So it was, you know, me and my grandmother, my uncles. But my uncles live in America, mm -hmm. and they came, they have nice things, and all the kids whose family live in America had nice things. I say, why don't you go to where the nice things come from, which is America. <laughs> and at an early age, I always wanted to stay in America. But, you know, we we have something we call Komso in Ghana, which, I don't even know, Komso. But it has a completed college where you apply to several colleges hoping okay. that you get a scholarship. Mm -hmm. So I tried as early as 14, 15 to come to high school here. But of course, I didn't have the resources even sometimes to mail it, to mail a, to mail a, a letter the, application. The, yeah. you know, and, and at that time, nobody wants to help you. You know, when, when, you know, even though you have people who are in the positions to help you, you know, they, Sometimes you know, your own dreams are your own dreams. A lot of people don't buy into your dreams until your dreams get close. And then everybody was you know, everybody wants a winning team. Everybody wants a winning person. And that's the same thing with life. You know, so even at 13, 14, when we were trying to get out of Ghana, this is middle school, we didn't, you know, we didn't have the resources. Okay, of course. Uh, after all levels, I realized, you know what, for me to achieve my dreams, I need to go to America. So A levels, even though I did extremely well at all levels, um, my headmaster, you know, I was predicted uh, to do very well, to get four A's. 
But you know, that was not my goal. My goal was not to get four years in Ghana. My goal was to leave Ghana as, as fast as I <laughs> could as and go to America and study. But you know, the journey just to come here, you know, I, I stumbled upon, of course, everybody's dreams to go to Harvard, Hopkins, and, mm -hmm. and those Ivy League schools. But of course, it costs money. <laughs> And uh, even to take the SAT, all these things require money. But you know, I've always considered myself very lucky. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I know that I'm blessed and highly favored. And I know God chooses certain people to bless them because of their heart. Because you know, just like He chose Moses, Joseph, mm -hmm. David, you know, it's not just to bless you to keep the blessing, but mm -hmm. to spread the blessing. So I, I felt, you know, I've always felt very lucky. Mm -hmm. Okay. And like one of my mentors always talk about luck is being prepared when the right opportunity arrives. I was always prepared because you never know what's going to happen. But, you know, coming here, you know, of course, that was part of the plan. You know, so A-levels, I was not paying attention. But people say, how did you end up in Texas at Midwestern State? Mm -hmm. I stumbled upon that school, of course. You know, I applied, I applied to some of the prestigious institutions. But, you know, growing up when I 18 years old, I'm thinking... Oh, there is this school in Texas, Midwestern State University. One of my uncles live in Arlington. But, you know, living in Ghana, looking at zip codes, <laughs> my uncle's zip code was, I think, uh, my, you know, Mid Midwestern State. Wichita Falls was 76, 76305, and then my uncle was 76019. So I thought, oh, maybe they're not too far. I can't, I can't even walk to school. Interesting. But, you know, that's one of the reasons why I mm -hmm. zoomed in on that school. Mm -hmm. And, of course... Um, they gave me the best package. People said it was the cheapest school I applied, fifteen thousand mm -hmm. dollars. But you know, nobody in my family had fifteen thousand dollars. But you know, that's another top, that's another interview. That I, <laughs> you know, but you know, by the grace of God, I mean, even my own uh, admissions fee, application fee to the school, just for them to review my application, was paid by a stranger. Wow! Somebody I met in Ghana, in my who had who had attended my high school. And he was visiting one summer and I was on campus studying for, I think, O levels. Studying, and you know, he brought his family. He's a doctor in Massachusetts. And that's one person I would like mm -hmm. to thank today. I've tried, I think, six years ago, I tried to find him. I found him mm -hmm. in New York. I think he retired. I think he moved back to Ghana. But I called him Collect. I don't know what. I said, hey, this is a young kid that you met. Mm -hmm. uh, can you pay $50 for me? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I asked him and my uncle, but, you know, when I came to school and I went to the uh, admissions office, there was a check from Dr. Garte. His name is Garte. Dr. K. N. Garte. I don't know what the K stands for. I don't know what the M stands for. But I would never forget his name. He was one of those strangers that God put in my path to help me. You know what? what Give I'm a shout saying. out to him right there. Shout out to so Dr. Dr. Angels. Garte, you know, <laughs> you are one of my angels. Uh, if it wasn't for you, I'd probably not be sitting here today. The $50 that you paid has come a long way and has touched so many souls. So thank you very much if you are watching this. Yeah, shout out to Angels. It's so funny you tell that story. I have a similar story. I don't want to be the one interviewed now. We give <laughs> shout out to Angels and people. So all that the Angels out there. All the people <laughs> who do things that we're yes. talking about, keep doing them. You yes. Know? Because when you bless certain people, those people bless other people. And, you know, uh, uh, just by touching me with that small donation, which in my, in my at the time, in my financial situation was a lot of money, you know, uh, that has done wonders, has touched so many souls, and has healed so many people. So thank you very much. Yeah. So let's take it to now. You wanted to always become a medical doctor. What about, but did you think about becoming a surgeon? Because now you're not only the gifted doctor, and we know why, but you're also this plastic surgeon to the stars. And you do a lot, not just here, you do charitable work, we'll get into that. Was being a surgeon, becoming a surgeon, one of your ambitions? So yeah, becoming a surgeon at an early age, about 15, mm -hmm. 15, 16, I knew I wanted to be a surgeon. And people say, how does a child growing up in Ghana really? knows about plastic surgery? You know, like everything is God. But my life, you can't script it, you know. And if <laughs> I were to go back, and I cannot chart the course if mm -hmm. it wasn't something God had laid out for me. But uh, at an early age, at around that, around that time, I saw, I witnessed the power of plastic surgery at that early age mm -hmm. through our patient smile, which is um, was started by a doctor named Dr. McGee, who was a plastic surgeon. But they had come to Ghana. They came to Ghana and they did surgery on a neighbor 
whose boyfriend at the time had poured acid on her face. So as beautiful as she was, she never left home. She was deformed. But you know, after operation, smile operating her, she became a brand new person. She was happy. She came out of her shell. She came out into the neighborhood. Wait a and minute. I witnessed, I witnessed, wow, I witnessed it first time because her younger brother was a good friend of mine. So I used to play in the house. Okay. They, you know, they have money. Of course, I told you I wasn't, you know, I wasn't poor, I wasn't rich. I mm -hmm. grew up in a good neighborhood mm -hmm. because of my uncles. My uncles had, you know, a little money because they had lived in America. So they were, you know, they were middle class in their own sense. You know, they had a car. If you have a car in Africa back in the day, you're rich. You're rich, you know. So, <laughs> but, you know, I live in the house. But just to live in that neighborhood, mm -hmm. I got to meet so many, you know, other kids. But without living in that neighborhood, I've probably never seen that girl. Right. But that's how I saw. Uh, that was the first time I witnessed this process, right? Wow. And uh, on that, from that day onwards, I vowed, I said, well, this is what I want to do. And uh, that dream and that aspiration never left me. And everything I did from that point, I wanted to be the best so that I can be a doctor. Wow. And I knew that the only way you can be a plastic surgeon was America at the time. And that's why I wanted to come to America so bad. Wow. Tell us a little bit about your area of specialization, because when we, t you know, when we think of plastic surgery, most of us think about the vanity side of it. We want to look good, but here you are talking about how it transformed this woman. What, uh, what's your area of specialization and what so, can plastic surgery really so, do? So plastic surgery, of course, it has the connotation mm -hmm. in this world, especially in this town. Mm -hmm. you know, it's not all about you know, butts and breasts and you know, plastic surgery, the word plastic comes from the Greek word plasticos, right. meaning to mold. Mm -hmm. And plastic surgery dates back before Jesus was born, mm -hmm. uh, before Jesus, God gave us Jesus. And it was to reconstruct defects. Right. Okay. And of course, plastic surgery became very popular in the reconstructive aspect after World War II. There was a lot of war injuries, so that made a lot of people mm -hmm. you know, start tending to it, ah. looking into plastic surgery. Plastic surgery, has different components to it. Mm -hmm. uh, you have maxillofacial surgery, mm -hmm. you have craniofacial surgery, you have reconstructive surgery, mm -hmm. and there are different types of reconstructive surgery that you can focus, head and neck, breast, okay. trunk, extremities, mm -hmm. and you have cosmetic surgery. Cosmetic surgery is just a fraction of it. Mm. It's just a fraction of it, but every plastic surgeon, a true plastic surgeon, has been fully trained in all these aspects. Okay. okay. When it comes to cosmetic surgery, now yes, there are fellowships that you can do just to learn more about cosmetic surgery. But at the end of the day, it's a person's appreciation for beauty or an eye for beauty. Mm -hmm. Now if you have the tools, the principles and techniques, you know, just like learning how to cook. Mm -hmm. Okay. Some people are gifted, you know, right. you can I can give two women the same recipe, but their food will taste different. Because some people, they just... Just have it. Go, yeah, they just have something. That mm -hmm. have it. And that's one of the things that I feel like God has given me. And mm -hmm. Like yesterday, I sat here and did a... I removed ribs. And another wow. plastic surgeon, you know, of course. You know, removing ribs so that to streamline the waist to make mm -hmm. the waist smaller. Mm -hmm. And the other plastic surgeon came to watch me. And she's like, how, how did you learn how to do that? I said, a person called me one time and said, can you do it? I said, if I can think about it, I can do it. Just like if you can think about, you go to a restaurant, you see mm -hmm. a food, a dish, and if you're a good cook, you can go home and yes. pretty much duplicate it. So, you know, right now, most of my practice here in Beverly Hills mm -hmm. has, has been about 85, 90% cosmetic surgery. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I came out in the reconstructive world, meaning mm -hmm. that, you know, even after my plastic surgery training, I spent another year at Harvard doing complex reconstruction and microsurgery. Okay, hand and microsurgery. And I feel like if mm -hmm. you can do microsurgery, right. if you can operate under the microscope and reattach little tiny vessels that is that are about one millimeter in diameter, okay, with that focus and intensity and attention to detail, there's nothing that I can't do. And also I have a good eye for beauty. So that's how I fell into cosmetic surgery. And, you know, and I still go around the world doing you know, free reconstructive surgery to yeah. date for the last decade. I've been to over seven different countries. Mm -hmm. We've done over 1,000 surgeries. Yeah. If we were to put a monetary figure of it, money is over 40, 50 million dollars right. for free of charge. So you are really passionate about this. 
it's very complex, I imagine. It's not an easy choice of career, but there are young people out there, maybe in Ghana right now, who are looking at you and dreaming how um, it's a good field and has a future. And you have been described as the gifted doctor. Tell us about some of the things that you've been able to do that are that, that your has, special that has, that yes. has blown my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, I think one of the things that today, you know, my claim to fame uh, <laughs> my, is to reattach them. Yes. Uh, you know, to reattach them. Of course, I have never compared myself to God, and I'm not God, I'm not a disciple, I am just a man. An ordinary man doing extraordinary things because of the grace of God, <laughs> and uh, you know, just to just put things in perspective, I was in Gabon in June, and we did the first intersex. That's what they call it in Africa, right? but the first we converted the first hermaphrodite in the Central Africa in the Gabon region, mm -hmm. the first in the country in Australia. That the first it was covered by BBC and Reuters, mm -hmm. but I remember a judge who was a friend. A judge came to me and said, now I see why surgeons think like they're God, because you guys can change things. Wow. You just made a man a hermaphrodite, you know, right. a true hermaphrodite, 28 mm -hmm. years old with breast, mm -hmm. you know, 38 D breast, you know, with a penis and scrotum. Uh, you know, has had a conflicting gender growing right. up, can't find love. So these are real things. These are real things. And, you know, we did the first one in Gabon back in June this year. And she's telling me, now nice, I feel like you guys feel like you are God because you can do anything. I said, no, no, I'm not God. There's only one God, and that's yes. God of Abraham. You know, so those are some of the things that mm -hmm. I'm doing. We are touching the limbs. Uh, you know, pretty much. I always say, if I can think about it, if I can envision it, right. I can do it. That is just awesome. So now it's a given that you have this gift. But how do you go, because there are sure there are other people who are good at what they do, but how are you able to be sitting here in Beverly Hills? What was that journey from coming from Ghana, going to school in the United States, starting your practice someplace else? Beverly Hills is not an easy place. It's, not, it's one of the most difficult <laughs> places to yeah. practice. The most competitive place. Uh, you know, I just gave an interview in uh, Burundi. I just came back from Burundi. Mm -hmm. And I was telling them that there are more plastic surgeons in Beverly Hills than the whole continent of Africa. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that's a uh, thing. But it was never mm -hmm. in my dreams to come mm -hmm. to Beverly Hills. Of course, I knew I wanted to be a doctor. Not in my wildest dream that I thought I would ever practice in Beverly Hills. Yeah. <sighs> and I said my journey, when, when I look at my life and go back, it's, it's a dream, it's like I'm still dreaming. You know, I remember yeah. when I tried to move here and people say, why LA? I had dinner last night, I was talking about the same story. You know, I came here, I went to school in Texas, University of Texas Medical Branch for medical school. Did my residency, went to Harvard. I got recruited at our Harvard to be chief of plastic surgery. My first job, I was a chief of plastic surgery <laughs> because of the skill set that I right. possessed. Um, I did the first job arm reattachment in uh, Northeast Ohio, first successful arm reattachment in Northeast Ohio. And, and when I decided to to move, and, you know, that was my dream job. I, I love to work, I love to do surgery. Uh, hospital treated me very well. They gave me everything I asked for. It was a really tough decision to move. And people say, why would you leave? And I cried when I left. I cried. One of my mentors said, I'm about to cry right now. He said, what are you mm. going to do? I felt like I was leaving the people who needed me the most. But right. you know, I've always had a dream, and my dream is to do free practice surgery all over the world. Right. Okay. And I, I joke around that uh, if I was a trust fund baby, I would not be sitting here. You know, every two weeks out of year, I mean, two weeks out of the month, I'll be somewhere under the teaching plastic surgery and doing free surgery. Right. Of course, you know, I have children, I have family, I have a over 100 people depend on me, so I have to work. And those you left in Ghana. And these, this is what pays the bills. <laughs> yeah. But eventually, you know, when it's all said and done, mm -hmm. I want to be traveling and doing free plastic mm -hmm. surgery. And God continues to bless me through other things. Yeah. And hopefully that dream will be a realization mm -hmm. very soon. Yeah. So, how do you stand out in Beverly Hills? That was a work ethic. What is it what that makes, makes me you stand out? Yes. Is my personality. 
you know, I don't believe I'm a doctor. I believe I'm here to serve, and mm -hmm. I, I don't like doctors myself. You know, mm -hmm. The doctors are too, they're different. They have different attitudes. Some people have a sense of entitlement, and mm -hmm. I don't feel like that. I relate very well to my patients. You know? right. I will sit and break bread with them, you know, I'm, I'm not here and they're not there, I'm not here or they're here, mm -hmm. we are on the same playing field. Mm -hmm. And that's what sets me apart. You know, right. How you talk to people, right. how you make them feel inclusive, and you make them feel good and good about themselves. Just talking to like human, humans, and I, hey, I'm the doctor, okay, you have to do it. You know? Right. That's what sets me apart. Yes. And of course, you know, my work, the work that I do, mm -hmm. sets me apart. You do have a lot of empathy. It looks like that's your characteristic even when you share your story and coming from just seeing this woman's life be transformed and you're transforming lives amazingly and you do you go you've gone beyond tell us about restore your charity so, so restore is, mm -hmm. is, is my you know, it's my baby it's, it's your baby, baby. It's, my baby. It's, <laughs> it's my it's my seventh child you know? <laughs> it's my seventh child but uh, I, I, I love the fact that God has given me a skill set that mm -hmm. I can use to mm -hmm. help so many people, change communities, you know. And it's not just fixing a child's lip or fixing a child's limb. When those things are done, the whole community changes. It That's changes true. the community. Just imagine, uh, and I don't know about Cameroon where you grew up, but you know, I remember kids were being hidden because right. of the fact that they'll be harmed. Mm -hmm. You know, we call them in Sioba, which is like Going to tell river babies that they mm -hmm. can't, they're not from God and mm -hmm. they need to be destroyed. Or, yeah, you know, and, and it's mm -hmm. not, it happens here, it happens mm -hmm. in Asia. It happens Is that what the uh, Nigerians call Obanji kind of babies? Is that it? Like in babies God, that return in or God something? We call them in Shilba. Okay, in Shil means water, yeah, but means babies, and mm -hmm. like water baby, like they came yeah. from these, you know, but yeah. and they have deformities, and mm -hmm. people, you know, will okay. hide these babies. Oh. You know, Families who hide them, you know, they, mm -hmm. they never get a normal childhood. Right. But just imagine with a 30 minute operation, just like we're just talking, just mm -hmm. by talking, by the time this interview is done, a child's lip would have been fixed okay. or, or, or can be fixed. Mm -hmm. And that changes the child's life for life. It changes the community, you know, it makes them more inclusive. You know, and that's what, that's my true passion. And, you know, we've been through so many and people come back and tell us their stories. Mm -hmm talking about women, women walking around with large breasts that hurts their back, you know, and just so many other things, so many yeah. deformities that we think that it's a curse. It's not a curse, mm -hmm. you know. The Almighty God is great. Everything has a purpose. Yeah. And, you know, it happens. Sometimes the division of cells doesn't go the way planned, or they divide, they have a mind of their own. And that's where these cleft lips are formed. I mean, I... Uh, uh, you know, becomes evident. Mm -hmm. And it's nothing the mother did, it's nothing the community did. These are normal babies, normal intelligence. It's just that they have a little defect yeah. that needs to be fixed. So as you go around, do you kind of try to educate the communities as well? Because is that what you're talking about, the cleft lip? Mm. You have the cleft yeah. lip for the children. So, yes. so you educate them so because educate. it's one thing to doing the physical work, but then when you're gone, is the community better educated also about future occurrences? Exactly. So that's what that's one thing I talk about. Not only we impact your child's life or your family, but we impact the whole community. Now okay. they understand. Mm -hmm. They understand it's not a fault of your own. It's not the river in that community that's creating these babies. Mm -hmm. It's something that happens. It happens in Japan. Mm -hmm. It happens in Australia. It happens in the UK. It happens yeah. in America. It's mm -hmm. just the fact that we don't have the expertise in yeah. some of these African communities to repair these defects and to get the kids you known. Know, the United States, by the time the child is three months old, mm -hmm. the lip has been fixed. Correct. By the time they are a year old, the palate has been fixed. Mm -hmm. You know, then between three and five, before they go to school, any revisions to improve the scar is done. But by the time they start kindergarten, they look almost normal. normal. They are normal, no kids will pick on them. They go to the playground and play. And by the time that they are old enough, when the nose is changing, by 15, 16, we we'll fix their nose so that it doesn't show that they have cleft lip. Right. And they're going to have normal life, normal oh. relationships, normal jobs, and they contribute to society. Yeah. You know? Can you just imagine the impact of looking different in Africa? And I mean, I don't even care where you are, even here, kids are mean. Oh, yeah, kids oh, are mean. They'll I mean. pick on you. So, what kind of needs do you meet? And 
how do you fund these needs? Because when I'm just listening to you, it's so many steps. You kind of fulfill all those steps. Do you do like a follow up? So yeah. So back to your question. I guess I didn't answer. I guess yeah, so. go for it. So back to yeah. So restore. I started restore eleven years ago. Okay. Eleven years ago, when I left Harvard, I went to Ohio. But it's uh, it's a vision I had when I was a fellow at Harvard. Mm -hmm. Of course, it was a seed that was planted in my head. Going right. back to when I was fifteen, Operation mm -hmm. Smile, the impact that they had uh, in this woman's life. And then, when I was in medical school, one of my mentors, John Miller, Dr. Miller, mm -hmm. one day approached me and said, Michael, you're from Ghana, right? I said, yes, sir. He said, why don't we go back to Ghana and do free surgery? So he's the one, actually, who planted the seed in my head, of course, back in 1999. But, you know, as a medical student, you know, you have no time to even sit and eat, let alone go to Africa for <laughs> surgery. And, of course, you know, it's not as simple as that. Mm -hmm. There are so many red tapes. I can't yeah. just pack my bag I know. and say, hey, let me go to Cameroon and do free surgery. Yeah. Uh, when I first when I first started to go to Ghana, of course I picked Ghana first because I was going to the country, mm -hmm. and I knew that I can break some of this red tape. But you know, at the time, this is back in two thousand and seven. When I decided, that, you know what, let me go back. Now that I am board certified, God has given me you know this talent, and I can help and educate people. I decided, I said, you know what. Now I'm done with my training, you know, I'm my own boss, I work for a hospital, I get a month vacation. I'm gonna give every, I'm gonna give two weeks out of my time and yeah. go and do free surgery. And the first place I picked, you know, obviously Ghana, my home country, I emailed, uh, you know, of course, thanks to the power of the internet, you know, I looked up the, the scope of plastic surgery. Yeah. Uh, Ghana at the time had five plastic surgeons, uh, more than the most African countries. There were three in my city, the city I grew up in, Kumasi. I grew up in the Ashanti region. And there are two in the capital city, Accra. And then there's a half, you know, he called himself a half, Dr. Welch. Mm -hmm. I mean, Dr. <laughs> He's a Welch surgeon who I retired and was helping them out, trying to set things up. But, right. you know, even when I emailed them, you know, nobody emailed me back. You know, sometimes they think you want to come and do an experiment on them. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of African countries, and I hate to send them out, you know. They are fearful. They're afraid that a lot of these volunteers are not true volunteers. They are there with an agenda. Mm -hmm. And they are there to experiment. And especially some of the Francophone countries I've been to, I mean, they don't trust. But Ghana, I chose Ghana because it's easier. I mean, I'm a Ghanaian and, you know, and of course I have to send my all my certificates. They invited me, I went. I never heard back from the capital city. So now people always, People always, um, what is it, accuse you, oh, you never go to the capital city because you're not from there because they never email me back. Oh. You know, I only go where I'm invited. I, I can't force my will no. on anybody, not even on the patient. Mm -hmm. So that's how I started. So I went, and of course, I couldn't even touch a patient because license is an issue. You have to have a license to operate because if not, you're committing, you know, battery and assault. Right. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> with a deadly weapon, you know, no, yeah, you have to have a consent. I didn't have a license, so the first year I went to Ghana, even though I went, I gave lectures, I taught, you know, I I taught them, walk them through how to do the surgery. The paperwork was not, they did not come through in time to do it. The second year I went, I was a little more productive, I, did, I was able to do living surgeries and Just teach. A quick question on that, what kinds of infrastructure Challenges do we have? Oh, that's a that's a different community. The challenges are just, uh, you know, insurmountable. You know, to, to so to speak, so many challenges. You know, equipment, just mm -hmm. we just don't have. Do you have that, surgical you know? units. You know, the surgical they are there, but they are not up to standards. Right. You know, they are not to standards. Uh, some of, some of these countries I've been to, they are deplorable, uh, and it's not the fact that it's not because we don't have money. It's because of our mindset, okay, as African, yeah. because we don't put emphasis on healthcare. Okay, I've been to countries where the people we invited me are sitting there, you know, every night they'll probably drink ten thousand dollars worth of champagne, but their own hospitals, you know, this place that I have here, how much did it cost to build all this equipment? About one hundred and fifty thousand. Mm -hmm. Most countries have hundred and fifty thousand to create facilities like this. You know, I've been to countries I will even mention that. I would not even let them operate on my dog in that facility. That's how bad some of these things are. 
No, but you know, back to Ghana. But so you know, the second year was a little bit better. You know, but of course, every year we take some equipment with that. We take things that we need, supplies that we need, and over time, it's gotten better. You know, uh, it started off eleven doing eleven cases. My biggest then in two thousand and ten, I took the first big team. You know, in my in my eyes, or um, I took what seven people to Ghana from a hospital from Ohio. And that year we did about 37 surgeries. Uh, we did 17 breast reductions. Uh, we did a 37 pound breast reduction of one woman. We took out 37 pounds. Just imagine having 37 pounds of weight pulling your neck yeah. down, pulling your shoulder. She was in constant pain. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the challenges. But you know, over time, things have gotten better. Uh, you know, now we are trying to do more missions. Mm -hmm. The biggest challenge is fundraising. Uh, yes. Because I have a full-time job and this is not, you know, I have self-funded restore maybe about 80, 85 percent of the time. Uh, the only countries that have done remarkably well, Gabon, I always give them credit. You know, they were my Bongo Foundation. Uh, the two trips that we've been to Gabon, they have paid for it for the volunteers to fly. But most of the time, the volunteers pay their own flight. But moving forward, because now we're getting so many requests, you know, and of course I have a day job. This year already, I've been to. I've been out of my office three months out of the year. Wow. Three months. So, you know, we're trying to make it broader, you know, ask for more donations so that we can get more volunteers. We just finished a mission in Ghana. In June, we're in Gabon. We did 88 surgeries in June. This year, I mean, in uh, last month, the restore team did 92 surgeries in Ghana. I wasn't there. So, but, so now things are in motion. I don't have to go to every single mission. But my goal is to do about four missions a year. Know, to four different countries a year. And the next in line is Cameroon. We're planning, <laughs> you know, we're planning to go to Cameroon in February. Okay. You know, February, uh, you know, for the First Ladies Foundation and also in honor of uh, Mr. Andre Sohan, uh, Aqua Palace, you know. Okay. So those, those are some of the things. But you know, these organizations that are willing to pay, it makes it easier, easier, you know, and I don't have to come out of pocket. Like even Ghana, for example, I didn't go, I still had to, you know, I had to pay out of my pocket, but this year they did such a remarkable job that it only costs, we call the volunteer, most of the volunteers pay for their own way. You know, the ones that we are re actually need, some of them they can't afford it, we are pay for it. But it's still, uh, this year the trip cost about maybe, I came out of my pocket about 13,000. You know, I didn't go. If I had went, that would have been out because of my airfare ticket. But it still cost $13,000 in supplies and things that I had to pay, that I pay for. You know, now, yeah, so I donate that to Restore, and then Restore then covers the cost of it. That is really, really expensive. Have you thought about the mindsets back home, how you, how Restore can maybe start changing the mindsets back home and start edu helping groom some future surgeons back home so, so that that's what can't So that's what it. we've done. Really? So restore. So okay. the, the difference, I always people say, what's different between you and Operation Smile? Not only we go to do surgery, but we also educate because... You know, you teach a man how to fish, they yeah. can feed themselves. Right. Now, Ghana has about 17 plastic surgeons. Okay, when I first started going there, there were five. Mm -hmm. The person who led this year's team in the northern part of Ghana, Dr. Koya Pakohoi Williams, he's a plastic surgeon, he credits it to me because mm -hmm. I, I inspired him. Because he had just finished medical school, uh, with his housemanship, when I first went to Ghana. And he said he saw my passion and how well I love my job. And even his professors looked up to me as a young kid. And mm -hmm. I, uh, I went to Ghana, I think I was 33, 34. And he said, wow, I want to be like this guy. And now he's our chief medical officer for Restore. That's awesome. You know, so, and I, I love the man. Now he's chief of, also chief of plastic surgery at the same hospital, the first hospital I ever did surgery, which is the largest teaching hospital, you know, uh, outside the capital, mm -hmm. you know, so. Yeah. That's the impact. Well, that's and, good. I'm glad. And just now, just find a young kid in Burundi who wants to be a plastic surgeon that we're going to set up and help Burundi train him because there's, there's no plastic surgeon in Burundi. Togo, Togo doesn't have a plastic surgeon. Uh, you know, the list goes on. You know, I was in Kenya, 55 million people. There are about 10 to 12 plastic surgeons. Uganda, the same way. So, you know, there's a shortage of plastic surgeons in every, almost every country. So, we really want to encourage young people future medical doctors to look into yeah, you know, into this and, career. And it is, it's a great, it's a great feeling it's to, to be able, it's not even about money. I always tell yeah. people, don't chase money. Mm -hmm. Chase a good work. Chase, mm -hmm. do good job, you know. Even if you're a janitor and you do a good job, God will bless you and make money. Absolutely. It's not about money at the end of the day, it's about 
how passionate, being able to get up and go to work, yeah. you know, and, and you like it. You have to love what you do, so they love for it. But if you do a good job at it, the money will come. The money will come. Yeah. So how can Africans in the diaspora, especially because this is a diaspora show that's reaching mm -hmm. the continent as well, how can we help restore and help Dr. Obey multiply this effort to a thousand times over? That's a beautiful Fair. question. <laughs> so the way to help restore is to continue to spread the good works that Restore is doing and also financial support. Uh, you know, we, about six years ago, we figured it cost about $380, almost $400 to restore a child. Um, you know, every penny helps. And, you know, if we can make enough, I mean, raise enough money, invest in the stock market and use the, you know, use the uh, uh, residuals or the, the interest to, to fund these trips, I think we can have more impact. We can touch more people. And, and that's the message I want to send out. You know, every penny helps, every penny. Of course, we're always looking for uh, healthcare professionals. You don't have to be a healthcare professional to come. Every year we have one or two or three people on the, on the, on the team who does logistics, mm -hmm. who helps transport kids, who go to the villages, bring the babies, who keep them, read to them, play with them. You know, they all help, all these things help. Mm -hmm. So for those of you watching, those are some of the things that you can do. Uh, it's not just about money. But, you know, money goes a long way. But, you know, your physical, actual presence can be there. And also spreading the word about the good works of Restore uh, can get us to the, uh, the the ultimate goal where I don't have to sit and work for money, that I can go and train more people all over the world. Wonderful. So let's talk about some life lessons here, Doctor. Sure. A journey like yours must have been fraught with a lot of challenges up to this point and how you put yourself in that mind frame to overcome challenges. Listen to your inner voice, okay? Listen to your inner voice and never give up. Um, now, friends will discourage you. Okay? Even family members will discourage you. They say, "What? Well, this is too big of a goal." Right. You know, but you, we nobody knows you better than yourself. You know, we know ourselves. We know what we are capable That's of. That's right. Of course, even right now, sometimes you know, it, it it gets so it gets difficult. And sometimes, what am I doing? I need to stop, but I can't stop because I feel like God put me on this earth for a reason. That's so. True. You know, when, when you are fraught with challenges, you just have to step back, rethink, and, you know, look at the bigger picture, you know, the impact that you are going to make. Right. And that's how I find my challenges. You know, right now I'm going through challenges right now because to leave my office in Beverly Hills for three months, not traveling and working, okay? You know, my advisors think I'm stupid and crazy, <laughs> okay? And my, my goal to change healthcare in Africa, they think, you know, it's too lofty of a goal to be able to change, but it's not lofty of a goal. When Steve Jobs started to, to set up Apple and the MacBook and all this, you know, people thought he was crazy. He's changed the world. And when I, started, when I talk about money, you know, his job was not to go out there to make money. He said, let me I see how I can make life easy on people. Right. Okay. Yes, my passion is to make sure, my passion is to be able to create a health culture, a healthcare culture in Africa that parallels the Western world. And we can do it, okay? We are one of the smartest, you know, groups of people on this planet, okay? Black people, African people excel in so many fields all over the world. Mm -hmm. How can we can excel in our own continent? That's a good question. Okay? And some of the reasons why is our priorities are misplaced. And, and I can sit here and I get emotional about it and I get upset about it at the same time. But, you know, our priorities are misplaced. And I will give you perspectives. In 2011, I was in Ghana, the northern part of Ghana. We did a mission there and I cried that a town of about 500,000 people did not have a dialysis machine, did not have a mammography machine, Mm. Okay, and they have built a stadium for 25 million. So the volunteer said, but how come they don't have a machine to just look at women's breasts or dialysis, but they have a 25 million dollar stadium? Guess what they built a stadium for? For the African Cup Nation. How many soccer, how many games did they play there? Two, three games? But that's the thing, that we have the money, we have the resources. It's just putting our resources where we actually need it. And healthcare has, not, has never been a priority for our leaders in Africa because of the fact that 
they think that they can get in their private jets and fly to Europe, to America, to India, to South Africa. They feel like, you know, but you know, one thing, when I sit down with heads of states and their families and, and powerful men and women in Africa, you know, I would sit and say, did you know that if you couldn't breathe, you're having a heart attack in the middle of the night, you would die? They look at you and say, what do you mean I would die? I said, by the time you are somewhere, your private jet, your pilot, your crew, you have a window of opportunity, okay? And this is the education that I'm embarking on. And of course, this has led to me starting a new business because as I say, I never started, thought I would be a plastic <laughs> surgeon in Beverly Hills. Yes. Traveling through Africa and Asia and uh, Central America, I felt like there's a need. And in this education, the power of education, if you can educate these leaders, then you know what? You can do the same thing I've done here. It just costs money. Let's help you find the money. And these are things, you know, um, I was in Cameroon, I met with the Prime Minister, uh, I think back in uh, June. And what a passionate man, a man talking about, you know what, healthcare, stroke. He wants to, he wants Cameroon to invest in a stroke center because a center of excellence for stroke. But the same thing, stroke, if you don't get to a stroke patient within a small window of opportunity, mm. their damages are irreversible. Yeah. These are the things, and you know, I talk about it, I get angry because of the fact that we have the resources, but we are not putting the resources where we need it. You know, we don't realize that health is wealth. Health is wealth. You know, a healthy country is a wealthy country. And that's why, you know, these countries, the Japan, you know, America, the greatest country, some of the greatest countries in the world, because they are healthy. When you are healthy, you can work. You can work, and when you work, the GDP goes up. Everybody benefits from it. You know, and I hope that our leaders who are watching this, people with decision-making capacities, you know, start thinking about, you know, health. You know, health is everything, uh, and we take it for granted, we as Africans, and it's not, you know, it's a gift. Dr. Hobing, do you really think that our leaders don't know that health is wealth and that their people need the help? I, I just think that it's even, even Even for themselves. Yeah. You know, a lot of African leaders, they would die. They don't have the, you know, it's funny, I, and I won't mention, you know, because I know a lot of... I was in a country not too long ago. Oh, the the the, the president has one doctor. Mm -hmm. but can the doctor really save this president? Do you have all the machines? Sometimes they might have the machine, but they don't even know how to use it. You know. But so, one of the biggest things I went. I was at a General Electric conference several years ago in D.C., and they talk about over sixty percent of malfunction equipments in Africa is just a battery. Oh. A battery. They're just missing a battery, but nobody checks. You know, the checks and balance and I, you know, nobody, it's sad, it, it's, you know, I'm, I'm about sad. to get angry. I get angry when I talk about it, is that as intelligent as we are, you know, the little things, we don't put emphasis, you know. And I, Congo, I was in DRC and I was shocked. If I showed you some of the pictures from the operating room, you will sit here and cry. And is DRC, it a mindset thing? DR, it, it is, that's what I'm saying, it's education. If you don't educate, and you know, some of these new leaders, you know, mm -hmm. I met with the first lady and, you know, she realized, you know what, wow, sometimes they don't know. Go, you know, they travel because, okay, you and I, you know, nobody goes to the hospital every single day mm -hmm. unless we are sick. Yeah. And some people might go through life, their whole entire life, without ever visiting the hospital. So sometimes it's maybe it's not their fault. Maybe they don't know. Right. But, you know, I think every leader should take a time out of their busy schedule and visit, you know, health facilities and see and compare it to the facility that they visited when they went to London right. to see the difference. Because they wait till they, they go out of the country and get checkups. So they never see how deplorable some of these facilities are, you know. And, I really and, credit and, and you for giving them all that credit because you know. they all come here and they see uh, the structures and, I hope and they so, go home and know? they don't care about the little people. So we're just going to move on. Let's talk to the kids who are growing up and who are feeling hopeless in these situations. What's your um, little piece of singular advice you can give them about feeling hopeless and what the potential is for them, especially for a child, from a child like when you were younger, where you are today? You know, my, my advice is don't feel hopeless. Uh, you know, uh, life is full of, uh, life is full of chances. Uh, you know, the Almighty God has places on this earth for a reason. Yeah, you might go through challenges, but you know, stick to your guts. You know, find something that you are passionate about. When you are passionate about something, you can always get up and do it. And you know, everything that follows after that. Now, my passion was when I wanted to be a doctor. And I said, whatever it takes, and I did whatever it took. Okay, when I came to America, I worked three jobs. You know, of course, you know, it might, it, it might, 
in my mind, as an 18-year-old kid, the thing about, so I'm going to go to America, you know, I need to save 15000 to go to school. Okay, this is how I'm going to do it. I had a plan. I don't always create a plan. I had a plan, even though it was not reasonable, and <laughs> of course, we don't know certain things coming to play. I had a plan that, oh, okay, if I work, you know, if they get paid $5 an hour, and I work every day, I work 20 hours, that's $100 a day. But of course, you know, 18 years old, you think, okay, you are invincible, you're not gonna die, you're not gonna get tired. I had energy, I was focused. Yes. And then you forget there's something called taxes. That, you know, even though I had done this, you know, this nice, you know, nice calculations in my head, that if I work 20 hours a day, every day, I only sleep four. Right. We forget you have to take a shower, you're gonna brush your teeth, <laughs> preparation for work, and you forget. <laughs> and of course, you know, growing up in Ghana, you know about taxes. And forget about, but oh, I remember my first paycheck. I said, where's the, where's the money? money? <laughs> <laughs> but all those things, but you know, the, the, the key, the message is don't give up. Don't give up, you know, continue to work hard. Um, there are going to be curveballs, there are going to be challenges. But, you know, I always say that in my life, I've always had plan A, B, C, D, and E, okay? I've never, I always have a plan. And, you know, people might think you're stupid, but I'm always three steps ahead of everybody. You know, and if plan A doesn't work out, plan B has already been hashed. That's true. So plan B A and B are always working concurrently, you know, and C is there. So, you know, I always have a plan. But, you know, when you want to do something and you set your mind to it and you pray about it and you work diligently towards that, that is going to be manifest. Absolutely. So, so how do you feel being inspired by that? you feel successful? No, you know, this doesn't make me feel successful, you know. The, what makes me feel successful is putting smiles on people's faces. These little kids who have no hope, mm -hmm. these women who have been battered, that to see them smile again, mm -hmm. to see them email you, say, thank you for changing my life. Thank you for changing my community. And that's what I call success, you know. Are you at least living your American dream? Mm -hmm. That dream mm -hmm. that we wanted to manifest from the time you were a little kid. I'm living, I'm living, but see the dreams keep changing. You know, I'm a dreamer. <laughs> You know, I'm a dreamer. Right now, my ultimate goal, you know, I always, say people, I always joke around. I ask people, grown people, I say, what do you want to do when you grow up? They say, what do you mean? I'm already grown. I say, I'm still trying to figure out what I want to do. Right. You know, of course, if I had everything that I wanted, all I want to do is just travel and do free surgery. Mm -hmm. But right now, my, my passion is turning into, you know, healthcare advocate, which I do. You know, a global healthcare strategist. And I see so much that can be done. Mm -hmm. And I just came from Burundi, meeting with the Minister of Health. Mm -hmm. And he's young, and I like these young ministers and young presidents because they are full of ideas. Because mm -hmm. they travel, they haven't lived in that country all their life. They saw, they've, they've left the country, they, they see the good and the bad, the good and the bad in some of these Western countries, and they want to bring ideas. And I love the fact that a country like Burundi, which is, I, I, never, I didn't want to go at first, <laughs> you know? I didn't want to go until the power of persuasion, they never gave up. They said, please come, 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 come. I finally said, you know what? I'm going to come. And for two days I was there, I was like, wow, I wish I had stayed longer because it was so beautiful and everybody is nice. The Minister of Health is so proactive and willing to do so much for his people. And that's what we need in Africa. We need these young guys running for president. You know, the older people, you know, they their time is up. They have to go. You know, the, the, the ideas are old, you yeah. know. Antiquated ideas. Yeah, the ideas are old. And, you know, and the thing is, Every country is corrupt, okay, even the Western countries. But, you know, the job gets done. Yeah. And that's what we think about Africa. They ask me, what do you think is wrong? I said, because of greed. We're too greedy. We, you know, we don't, I mean, somebody will get a contract to build a road or build a hospital and nothing will be done. They will just spend the money, split the money among themselves and nothing gets done. And then the next government does the same thing. They will order a bunch of equipment, but no equipment will ever come. They just split the money. That needs to stop. For Africa to compete, you know, they say, oh, China used to be like that. No. For Africa to compete and be on the same stage like like China and the Americas, you know, we need to continue to work hard and we need to stop the greediness and the corruption. So or, how or are we in the diaspora going to help change these mindsets? Because these are the mindsets and the people back there already are the way they are. This is a great how question. This is through dialogue like we are talking about. You know, I think... Uh, you know, people in higher places who has a voice. These are, and I think ongoing conferences to talk and invite the youth and talk about. You know, freedom of speech, that's what makes America the greatest country. To be able to talk, you know, and the leaders will hear this because, of course, once you make enough noise, the papers pick it. And these days, because of the power of social media, it's so much easier 
to get your information across. So it's through dialogue that these leaders will hear this, that these leaders you know, need to be held accountable. But it's all about dialogue. We as a diasporans need to start talking about it. We've seen it. We've seen the pros and cons living here. We've seen the pros and cons living in Africa. So peaceful in Africa. You know, every, yeah. But through dialogue, through communication, you know, conferences, I think they will hear what we are talking about. They will hear what we, you know, what we speak about. And hopefully, they will take some of the comments that we gave, some of the feedback, to implement change. Yeah. You know what? I believe that one life is worth changing. Because look at that young man who is now chief of something. Yeah, the, he's chief of know. class, Dr. Dr. Parker Hoy Williams. That's right. So you know, and I'm so proud of him because now he has also trained so many plastic surgeons. I, I'm just going to send him a kid from Burundi. Of course, mm -hmm. I say a kid. He's not a kid. Yeah. He's a doctor, mm -hmm. a young doctor. He just emailed me. Mm -hmm. And I called him. I said, hey, I got one for you. You know, it's much easier to be trained. And I told him, you know, you all have a personal invitation to come here and spend a few months. Mm -hmm. The challenge is in America is hard. You can't touch a patient because you don't have a license. Mm -hmm. My practice, so it's much easier. And I'm as, I'm as confident in Dr. Paco Williams as myself mm -hmm. that he can turn this guy into a great surgeon who will one day teach another child. Now, you teach a man to fish, they always have food. Always have food for the rest of his life. On that note, Dr. Obeng, I want to thank you for your work, for your empathy, and uh, wish you all the best. And uh, someone changed your life, and you're changing so many people's lives. And thank you so much for joining us. And uh, hopefully, you will be grooming the next generation of leaders. <laughs> you want leaders, you want future plastic surgeons, you want change. Change. So, but thank you very much for what you're doing. You know, media is so powerful, and without a voice, you can have all the ideas in the world. But if nobody hears your ideas, nothing will be done. And I hope that this interview changes somebody's life. And I know what you are doing is going to change lives and start the conversation because, you know, people like yourself, like the Oprahs, they started a conversation and it became a movement. And people started, oh, wow. You know, we talk about Dr. Arikana Chumbura Kwa, you know, who's one of my mentors, and I worked with her before the African Union asked her to step down. She has educated so many people. People did not even know that without Africa, they would not be France. That France is still taking the $500 billion out of Africa every year mm -hmm. and giving it back as loans and taking interest. You know, that's, 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 that's more than this slavery. That's, rape without that's torture and but she has been lied to these them. are people i didn't yes. even know i found out this about two years ago you know and i read, I read from time <laughs> to time but you know the, the power of media you know, and so I, I i i congratulate you i commend you for you and your team your lovely husband for doing what you guys are doing because you are shedding light on some of these issues and hopefully the whole world will pick up and hopefully our leaders in africa will wise up and say and not that people like the trump call them stupid and shithole countries because if we don't fix our own backyard mm -hmm. you know nobody's going to respect nobody. us mm -hmm. nobody so nobody respect us we can go toe to toe with america now china is going toe to toe with america mm -hmm. because and i remember growing up in ghana 20 30 years ago china was just as poor as africa but you know they changed their mindset okay and now china is a powerhouse and i know that africa will be a power with a, with a population of 1.2 billion that continues to go. We give a lot of bears. <laughs> okay? Yes. So if we don't change our mindset, mindset. we'll be impoverished for life. Mm, but if we, we change our that. if we change our mindset, we are the richest continent. Richest continent. DRC resources in DRC is estimated to be about thirty trillion. Yeah. Okay. And this is even their line to us because we don't we don't have our own stuff to figure it out. But this is what I tell <laughs> you. You know, like I would just tell Burundi, <laughs> if Congo has this Burundi code, just by Share location, exactly. location alone. Yeah. You know, these are some of the things. So I think, uh, you know, what you guys are doing is good. You know, the media is power. So congratulations, <laughs> and I commend you. Thank you so much, Dad. Thank you. Thank you.